What does it mean to be called? If you grew up in the church or you've been around evangelical churches, you have probably heard people talking about their callings and feeling called to different things. And the word is used really broadly because at the core of the word calling or to be called, it simply means to invite or to summon. And what we see in the Bible is that we all have a primary calling on our life. As believers, our calling is to respond to the call that Jesus gives each of us to follow me. Mark Laberton, who was the president of the seminary I attended, he wrote a book titled Called, where he talked about our primary calling. He says, the vocation of every Christian is to live as a follower of Jesus today in every aspect of life in small and large acts with families, neighbors, and enemies. We are to seek to live out the grace and truth of Jesus. This is our vocation, our calling today. So what he would say is unique for each of us then is our secondary calling, which is the way that we live out this primary calling to follow Jesus in the world. For some, they are called to ministry. Others are called to work in nonprofit. Others are called to the workplace. Some are called to the home and to children or to be caregivers, while others are called to take the name of Jesus and the message of the gospel all around the world. And in this series, we're doing something a little different. In this series titled Called, Pastor Daniel and I are sharing our calling stories to pastoral ministry. Now, you know that if you heard his story last week, he said that not all are called to be pastors, but everyone is called. And it is our hope by sharing these stories of our callings that you will get to know us as your pastors a little bit more and hear how God has worked in our lives, but that you also will explore and lean into how God might be calling you. Now, if you heard his story last week, you know that Daniel was called to be a pastor at a very young age. I realized while listening to his story that he was called into pastoral ministry at the age of 13 in the same year that I was called to surrender my life to Jesus for the first time in my 20s. Now, don't do the math, okay? That's not the, <laughs> that's not the point. That's not the point of the story. The point is that Daniel has a very different story than mine. Daniel's story is one of the straight and narrow, and my story is complicated and crooked. It is a story of not just having one call on my life, but having many calls on my life during different seasons. And if you've been in the loft for any time, you've probably heard my call story of how I came to know Jesus and surrendered my life to him. But if you haven't, I'm gonna give a recap of it here because it's part of my story in understanding how I got here is understanding where I came from. I grew up in the church, a small church in South Alabama. We were there every Wednesday and every Sunday, but I never had a relationship with Jesus. Um, there was a lot of anger in my home growing up, and I could not reconcile what I experienced in my home with what I was learning about God at church. And what I came to understand or believe about God is that he was angry and that he was judgmental, and that he was waiting for me to mess up so that he could punish me, and he had these ridiculously hard standards to live up to that inevitably I would always fail. So when I turned 18 and left home for college, I was done with God, done with religion, done with church, done with all of it, because all I really wanted was what I thought was freedom. I wanted to live my life any way I wanted to live it. I didn't want to have rules. I didn't want to have to follow anybody else's standards or plans for my life. I wanted to do whatever I wanted to do whenever I wanted to do it. And boy, did the University of Alabama offer me opportunity to do that. Woo. Uh, and so I fell into a crowd where we partied a lot. 
And all around me, as I grew older and by the grace of God received a degree, this crowd that I continued to be with and party with and do all the things that kind of came along with that lifestyle, things began to get really dark and destructive. I had a friend who took his own life. I had a series of things happen in my own life that were hard consequences, and it felt as if there was a lot of darkness all around me. And as I was in the downward spiral and I hit rock bottom, I prayed for the first time in my, my life, honestly, I prayed, I said, God, if you are real, I need you. I need you to rescue me. And he did. And at the age of 23, I gave my life to Jesus for the first time. And God not only rescued me from spiritual death, but I believe that God rescued me from literal death or other serious consequences because many of the people that I was friends with then are no, they're no longer with us. But my life, it didn't change overnight. My journey of discipleship and in my faith has been a long, hard journey through many of seasons where God has grown me and I have given up things and I've been obedient. And I would say that the time that I became most serious about my faith was in 2008 when we moved here to Texas. We moved in the middle of a battle of infertility that had really grown my, my dependence upon God in a new way in our relationship. We found a great church, we found a great Sunday school class who became our community, and God began to really grow my faith. And in 2009, when my twins were born, which was a huge answer to prayers, and we were loving being in the community that we were in and the church that we were in. But at the time, I was a branch manager for a large bank. My degree is in business. My experience and history has been in retail management as well as in banking. And I went back to work after the boys were born. I was working more than 60 hours a week. My husband was probably working more than that. And it, we were struggling to make it work with two young kids. And there would be weeks and days where I would not see my babies at all. They would be asleep when I left for work and they would be asleep when I got home for work. And so we both realized when they were close to a year old that this is not gonna work, something, something has to change. And so we began to pray about that and it seemed as if God was calling me to stay home. And so I did, and I did it very unwillingly. I went kicking and screaming into the stay-at-home mom gig. You see, I had this vision for my life. I had this plan for my life from really from a young age. I knew that I wanted to go into business. I had worked really hard. I had been promoted and moved up the ladder really quickly within several organizations, and I wanted to have a career. And I had built everything around that vision of my life. Now, if you have ever been a stay-at-home mom, you know that there is not a lot of glory in the stay-at-home mom gig. There's not a lot of affirmation, not a lot of praise, not a lot of great performance reviews, not a bonus in your bank account at the end of the quarter because you did a great job. Uh, it is really hard work, and I had built this identity around performance and achieving and affirmation, and when that was taken away from me, I felt like I was drowning. I felt like I was lost. I felt like I didn't even know who I was anymore. And so I responded to that by completely immersing myself into motherhood and staying a home mom. I began to obsess over play dates and Mother's Day out and uh, all sorts of programming for kids. And I would go to people's houses and I would see their playrooms and their setup and I would come home and now we needed a new house because we needed a new playroom. And then we needed a new car because I had to get the kids in and out of the car all day long. And so we had to have that also. And I obsessed about birthday parties and everything that you could possibly imagine are wrapping up your identity now into motherhood. But for all of that energy, all that I was expending, all of the dreams and plans that I was making, I would still crawl into bed at night exhausted, overwhelmed, empty, thinking there has, there has to be more to life than what I'm doing. And then God, as would have it, I don't even remember how I came across this book. I read a book 
and God began to use it to speak to me and change my life. It's a book titled Anything, The Prayer That Unlocked My God and My Soul. And as I read this book, my heart began to race because I identified so closely with her journey. I'm gonna read you a quote. Jenny writes, as real life and responsibilities moved in, I felt God pressed out. Religion, church, Bible study were all in place, but truly surrendered lives, the kind God could use anywhere in any way he chose, had quickly turned into planned and calculated lives that focused on things like saving for a home or a suburban. I was a Christian, but I was not living my life surrendered to God. I saw it in the things that I thought about, where I spent my energy, what I dreamed about, what I planned, what I hoped for. I wasn't building God's kingdom or living out any purpose for him. I was building my own life and my own kingdom. And so I repented and I began to pray this prayer that she prays in this book. I began to pray, God, anything, I will do anything. I'll surrender my life to you use me. And I remember I would lay awake at night, just my heart racing, pounding, thinking through what God might ask me to do. And I remember waking my husband up in the middle of the night one time and being like, hey, babe, what if God tells us to sell everything that we own and move to Africa to live in a mud hut? And he's like, um, could we talk about this in the morning, maybe? That, and I would just have these, uh, these thoughts and these dreams because I was like, this is real risky. This feels, but it feels right. It feels like what God is asking me to do to live this life of surrender. And it's the life that Jesus talks about in Mark 8. I'm going to read you the message translation. It says, calling the crowd to join his disciples, he stated, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to saving yourself, your true self. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? What could you ever trade your soul for? So as I began to pray this prayer and open my hands and saying, God, use me, turns out, didn't ask me to sell all my things and move overseas, but he did start bringing opportunities to me that I would say yes to. I was serving as a greeter and then they asked me to lead the greeter, so I said yes. And I was in mom's group and they asked me to lead in mom's group, so I said yes. And then one Sunday I went to church on Mission Sunday and I felt that God was calling me to go on a mission trip, so I said yes. And I went to Honduras with Living Water. And it was shortly after that mission trip that I received a call from our executive pastor. And he said, would you be interested or willing to work as a small group coordinator on our church staff? And because I was praying the prayer anything and I was saying yes, even though I had so much baggage and shame that I was still working through from my past and I felt terrified to be on a church staff, I said yes, and God began to do incredible things in my life. He opened up opportunities, and every time he did, I would say yes, and so I yesed myself over the next few years all the way to discipleship director, leading five ministries, and had a staff of 12 at some point. Out of the blue, shockingly, they asked me to be in a preaching class, and then after the class, invited me to preach on some Sundays, became the first female member of their preaching team. God in those years was faithful to do more than I could have ever possibly dreamed or imagined. And I believed that this was it for me. I would work at that church, in that job, and that calling for the rest of my life. I had found it and that was it. And then God began to change things. In 2017, I woke up, went to work, just thinking it was gonna be an ordinary day. 
And we had an all staff meeting and at that all staff meeting, we did an exercise. And in this exercise, we made a timeline of our history with God. We put these milestone moments of what God had done in our lives. And the purpose of the assignment is to be able to talk about your story, to tell people about your history with God and to share your testimony. And at the end of the exercise, we they led us through this prayer time. They asked us to just silently pray over that timeline and then ask God the question, what is next for me? God, what do you have next for me in my story? And as I prayed that prayer in the silence, clear as day, God said, I want you to go to seminary. And I thought, well, that, that doesn't feel possible. I, at the time, had very young twins. I was working more than full-time in ministry. I had a husband who traveled every day of the week, and I was in the midst of a battle with chronic illness that I have talked about sometimes in here in many sermons, but it was, it was intense. And it felt like it made no sense at all, that it felt entirely impossible that God would then ask me to also, in addition to all those things, go to seminary. So I did my due diligence, though. I went to one of the pastors who had mentored me in preaching, and I said, hey, I heard this. I heard God say this. What do you think about this? And he said, you know, it seems to me like you have these multiple things happening in your life. You have this job, this role, this calling here where you are working more than full time. You have young twins and you're a mom and your primary caregiver for them during the week. And then you would have seminary. And he's like, I can tell you from experience that seminary is an extraordinary amount of work and it is gonna require a lot of you. He said, so it seemed to me that if God is saying for you to go to seminary, he might be saying that you need to resign from this role that you have now in order to go to seminary. Because the thing that I know about you is that you will continue to do your job well and you will do seminary well, but the thing that will suffer is your family. And I said, well, then that solves it because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not interested in quitting. So I told God, so thank you so much for the idea, but um, I'm going to, I'm going to pass. I'm going to pass on this one. Really appreciate the word, but no, thank you. And then a few months later, I was at a funeral and it was a funeral for a family in our church. And there was a pastor who was officiating it knew the pastor, was not a pastor from the church that I was part of, knew who he was, never had a conversation with him in my life. He comes up to me after the service and he puts his hand on my shoulder and he says, the whole time that I was officiating this service, God told me that he had a word for you. He said, God told me to come tell you to go to seminary. (laughs) I was like, what is this? What is happening? Is this real life? And so I was in shock and I was in disbelief. But everywhere I turned, it felt as if this is what God was saying. Went out to dinner with friends one night. The wife looks at me and says, have you ever thought about going to seminary? I'm like, God, I get it. Okay, okay. I still don't know how it's going to work. And the thing that felt the scariest for me at the time is that what I realized was that God was changing my calling because it was one thing for me to commit to working at the church that I loved, that I had been part of, that I had accepted a job in, that I felt called to, that I thought was just me serving at my local church. But the idea that I would go to seminary meant that God was getting real about the idea that I was actually being called into ministry beyond just the church that I had been in, but into an unknown future in ministry in a place where I had no plans or ideas of how that would happen. You see, what happened to me is I went into ministry with my arms and my hands wide open, but somewhere over the course of those years, my fist had clenched around the role that I was in and the calling that I had. And for God to change my calling, he had to to rip it out of my hands. And so I went out on medical leave to recover from a major surgery that I had. 
And so I told God, you know what? I'm, I've got a break from work while I'm recovering from my surgery. Here's what I'll do. I'll apply for seminary and I won't get in. And that'll be the end of this. So I applied for seminary and I immediately got in. So I was like, okay, okay, okay. All right, we, all, we also have to pay for it, okay? So here's what I'll do, God. I'll apply for the scholarship. And if I get the scholarship, then I will go to seminary. So I apply for the scholarship and I'm waiting to hear. Weeks are going by. I'm still feeling that God's saying, leave my job and go to seminary. But I'm like, how are we gonna pay for it? None of this makes any sense. And so I, the date was sort of approaching that I knew that the honorable thing to do was to tell my boss, the executive pastor, that I was considering leaving and talk through that with them. But I kept telling God, I can't do that. I can't commit to leaving my job unless you give me this scholarship. I was calling that scholarship office every day. Hey, do you know when they're gonna give the scholarship? So I told God, I said, here's the date I made that I'm gonna go talk to the executive pastor. I need you to come through on the scholarship by that day, okay? Uh, and he did not. I had to go and I had to talk to my executive pastor and I had to tell him that I was leaving because I felt that God was saying I needed to leave and go to seminary. He says, for what purpose? And I said, I, I have no idea because what kind of sense does it make that I am living out of calling in a ministry in a church that I love, that I wanna do to leave that, go to seminary and then what? Go back into that same thing that I wanted to do, but now in debt? It made no sense to me at all, but it felt so sure. So I cry through that meeting. I go, I get in my car, sobbing. I open up my phone and there's the message that I received the scholarship. <laughs> Thanks. God wanted me to obey first. And so I said, okay, God, but I have two conditions to this situation, okay? <laughs> The first condition is that I never wanna work in a large church again. And the second condition is that I never want to be a pastor. And I don't know if you've ever seen this on Instagram, but it feels appropriate. It says, don't ever tell God what you'll never do because he will have you nevering like you never, ever, nevered before. <laughs> Anybody know that story? So it was a hard transition for me out of ministry. If you've ever worked on a church staff or in a team environment where you are working on mission or you're working towards a goal and you are with those people all day, every day, they become your closest community. So when I left my job, I left that daily community that I had of the people who had been my people for so many years. Uh, seminary I was attending, but it felt lonely and isolating. And I've talked about this in our series on mental health, but my grandmother passed away in my second quarter of seminary and I was diagnosed with chronic grief. And so this season felt hard. I knew that I was where God meant for me to be, but it felt like he asked me to give up or he took away a lot to get me there. And then a few months later, I received a phone call completely out of the blue from a woman named Pastor Susan Kent at the Woodlands Methodist Church. Never visited this church, never met a pastor from this church. Someone had given her my phone number and she was looking for someone who could come help with small groups, talk about small groups and leadership because they were looking to do some things here. And so she called me and she said, hey, would you mind coming and talking to us? They said about what you did at your last church and just kind of helping us get started and advise us. And so I came, met in the cafe with Susan and a couple of her staff members one day, spent several hours with them talking about ministry and uh, talking about what you guys do here. And then I left and I went back home out into the world. She wrote me a thank you note, sent me a Starbucks card and that, that was the end of it. I went back to being a mom and in seminary. And then about a month later, she sends me an email and she says, hey, I know that you said that you don't wanna work at a large church again. Uh, I know that you are going to just focus on seminary and your health and you're not ready to, to go back into ministry again, but uh, a pastor named Rob Renfro in the loft lost his associate pastor and he's got more work than he can do. And they're looking for someone who can work just part-time, few hours a week to help him out. And she said, I think this could be a good step in you 
discerning where you might be called in ministry or what you want to do, would it be okay if I gave him your information? I said, sure. So Rob called me and I came and I met with Rob. We talked about my health and my seminary, my calling. He cried, I cried. No one's surprised by that. He was here last night. He wept like a baby. It was great. And then I uh, heard about the position here just a few hours a week, no weekends, just helping him out. And then I left and I was pretty sure that I wasn't going to take it because I had decided that I wasn't ready to go back into ministry again, that I was going to be a mom and just go to school. And then I flew to Alabama to preach at a friend's Methodist church in Alabama while I was there, I was telling him about this, uh, about this conversation with the church, didn't tell him who it was. And he said, you know what? You're probably on track. It's probably good to just stay focused on school and your health. It sounds like that's the right thing to do. And then we went to lunch afterwards. And he said, do you mind asking me who the pastor is or what church it is? Maybe I know them. And I said, well, it's a pastor named Rob Rimpro from the Woodlands Methodist Church. And his face like immediately changed. And he's like, well, forget everything I said, okay? <laughs> because this changes everything. He says, somehow you have managed to get an offer to work for one of the best, if not the best pastor and preacher in all of Methodism. And what one says to Rob Renfro is yes, yes, I will come work for you. And you go there and you learn everything you can possibly learn from him. And I say this literally and without exaggeration that working with Rob Renfro changed my life. It taught me, he taught me about the kind of person I wanted to be, the kind of ministry I wanted to have, uh, the, the way that he cared for people and lived out his calling. Both he and Susan were just constant sources of affirmation and encouragement of my gifts and giving me opportunities to, to use those. And you people welcomed me in and embraced me and encouraged me and inspired me. And as much as I had decided that I was going to come here temporarily and remain detached and then go back off into the world again, I fell deeply in love with the people here and this church and the church staff and so much of leadership. And you have spoken encouragement into me and affirmation of my gifts and so 10 hours became 20 and 20 became 25. And then all along, both my seminary professors and people here were continuing to encourage me towards pastoral ministry. And I remember uh, Susan was just consistently in her message to me, which was, I believe that you have the gifts and I believe that you're called to pastoral ministry, but you and God have got to work that out. You've got to hear it from God and it has to be your call. But the thing was, it wasn't that I hadn't received the call because I knew that that was the call that God was asking of me when I was here in my first year. It was that I was resistant because I was telling God that he, he has gotten this wrong. He has gotten the wrong girl, that I am not pastor material. I am inadequate. I feel ill-equipped. My story is too hard. I made too many mistakes. I'm not the kind of person to be a pastor. Pastoral ministry for me was for people who got it right, who made the right choices, who had their life together, people like Daniel. And so I, <laughs> I told God, not me. And so I had filled out the application when I first heard the call and it sat on my desk for weeks and weeks. And then in the fall of 2020, we preached a series called Unlearning, and my topic was unlearning God. And I was talking about how sometimes we have to unlearn things that we believe to be true about God, but weren't really true in order to really understand and know who God fully is. And at the end of that sermon, I led this guided prayer time, and I led you through the question of asking God, God, what am I believing about you that is untrue? And at the 11 o'clock service, as I was guiding you through that question, God answered me. I said, God, what am I believing about you that is untrue? And God said, you believe that if you commit and that you give yourself to this calling or to this church, that I'm going to ask you to give it all up again. I'm going to take it away. So you are playing it safe because you are afraid. And underneath all of those reasons that I had was the fear of answering this call. 
Stephen Pressfield says this about our callings. He says, the more scared we are of a work or a calling, the more sure we can be that we have to do it. And so with a prayer again of anything and a desire to trust God, I went home and I put the envelope in the mail and I answered the call to pastoral ministry at the age of 41. And I went back as I was writing this and I read through things that I had written during that time. And I wanna read you just a short portion of what I wrote. I said, my struggle with insufficiency, inadequacy, and fear has been my companion since the first inklings that the Holy Spirit was whispering pastor into my soul. Jesus is sending me again into the unknown and it feels like he's asking more than ever from me. I am not sure what the future holds or what the path will be, but I am stepping into the calling as many before me have done, saying, here I am, send me. Here's what I know to be true about the power of the gospel, that God can redeem any story, any failure, any mistake, any messed up, imperfect, and flawed life and use it for his purposes. He did it in my life and he can do it in yours. And God doesn't want us to disqualify ourselves because of shame that we feel about our past or about mistakes or because inadequacy that we feel, but that Jesus died for us so that we could live in forgiveness and freedom so that we could be free to pursue the purposes that he has for our life. So my question to you today is this, what might God be calling you to do? Could God be calling you to pray the prayer of surrender, to pray anything to him, to open up your hands and to trust him? What would you do if you were not afraid? Let me pray for us. God, we thank you that you are a faithful God, even when we are not faithful. And that God, you have purposes and plans for our lives far beyond anything that we could ever dream or hope or imagine. God, I pray for anyone who has come here today who is struggling with their story, whether that is in their past, of the mistakes that they made, of their failures, of the choices or the lives that they have lived, or things that are happening right now currently in their life where they feel like they are getting it wrong and that they feel unworthy and they don't know what to do. God, right now, I pray that your mercy and your forgiveness, God, would just wave over their hearts. If that is you right now in this moment, I just encourage you to pray right now. Say, God, I don't wanna do this on my own anymore. I have messed up. I don't wanna feel this way anymore. I want to be a new creation. I wanna have new life. I want a fresh start. You can do that right here today. Just surrender your life to God. Surrender your future to Him. Turn your hands open and say, God, use me. God, I pray for all of us, God, that you would reveal yourself to us, God, that you would make your callings on our lives clear and that you would give us the courage that it takes to obey and to do hard things and to do the things that you ask us to do. God, we desire surrender. We desire to live our lives, living out our faith so that people around us can come to know the mercy and the grace and the power and the redemption that comes with calling you Father. So God, we praise you. I thank you for every story in this room today and the way that you are using them. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen.